We're so glad you're here to listen to this week's sermon from Park Street Church. Park Street is a historic congregation located in the heart of Boston. But more than that, we're a community of people from all different backgrounds who believe and are united by the good news that Jesus is Lord. Visit us at parkstreet.org to learn about our community. I do encourage you to keep your Bibles open to Acts chapter 16. Amy Carmichael was a woman from Belfast, Ireland in her early 20s, and she, in her own words, gave up small ambitions in order to preach the gospel to those who had never heard. While in her early 20s, she heard the voice of God speak to her, just two words, go ye. And when she heard this, she said, yes, Lord. It was in the early 1890s, after hearing the great Chinese missionary Hudson Taylor, she wrote in her journal in response to hearing him, does it not stir up our hearts to go forth and help them? Does it not make us long to leave our luxury, our exceeding abundant light, and go to them that sit in darkness? And so Amy applied to the Missionary Society to go to China, and to her shock and sadness, she got a letter telling her no. As a single woman, she was, in their words, too delicate. Well, nevertheless, Amy ended up going a short time later to Japan. And she spent 15 months in in Japan uh, facing illness, seeing some fruit, but it was a difficult time. And she, for a short time, went to Sri Lanka. And then from there, she went back home in illness and with quite a bit of disappointment. Amy had the call. She had the drive to go, to sacrifice to the Lord. But things were not quite aligned with the Spirit. I think in a similar way, the Apostle Paul had an incredible will and energy to go tell others about the gospel. The gospel of Christ crucified, of his atonement and the ransom of shedding of his blood for the forgiveness of sins. The gospel of Christ resurrected for the reconciliation of the whole world to God in new life. Today we're beginning a a six-week teaching series on Paul's second missionary journey, which is recorded here in Acts chapters 16, 17, and 18. And today is just the the opening of that missionary journey. That journey, as we'll discover in the weeks ahead, are about human sin and idolatry uh, having turned the whole world upside down, and how the gospel puts things right side up. It's this good news, the gospel, that is driving uh, the book of Acts in a way of an expansion. We see the expansion in the book of Acts in which Christ is poured out, uh, pours out his spirit upon his disciples in Jerusalem. And then there's the movement of the gospel from, from Jerusalem, from Jews to Gentiles, as well as this geographical movement that we see uh, throughout the book from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to to Athens, which we'll we'll hear about in a few weeks, and ultimately to Rome. The second missionary journey, it starts with a lot of energy and and movement. In fact, in this passage that we've just read, the Greek verb erkomai, uh, which is a verb that means to move, and it's translated mostly come and go. It it appears 13 times in this text. You can't tell in the the English, but it's this idea that there's a lot of energy, a lot of movement. And uh, it it seems that uh, I get the impression that the Apostle Paul, he's ready to go 100 miles an hour. They've just, he and Barnabas have just returned from their first missionary journey, and they want to go again. And in fact, the second missionary journey doesn't start in uh, chapter 16. It starts in chapter 15 in verse 36. And that's why I asked you to keep your Bible open so you can see it. Paul says, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word and and see how they are. And so he's ready to go again to where they had gone before. I think at the very least, Paul is not yet aware of what the Holy Spirit is intending to do on this trip. And my sense is, and I, I admit I'm reading a little bit between the lines, 
is that this journey doesn't start with a roar, it starts with a bit of a sputter. And I think there seems to be a, a certain level of misalignment between the initial mission and the Holy Spirit moving. What I think is in going on in this text, it reveals that the energy to go and to bring the gospel is right and it's good. But without yieldedness, we can be misaligned with the Holy Spirit. And I see two signs in this opening, two signs of misalignment with the Holy Spirit. And then uh, we see a, a yieldedness that leads to the opening of the gospel. So I, I want to uh, first pay attention to what I think are signs of misalignment with the Holy Spirit, which are, include division within the community as well as, as, as well as closed doors. First of all, division. Division in the Christian community is a sign of misalignment. And we didn't read this, but just before, beginning in verse 36 of chapter 15, we see that Paul and Barnabas have a very sharp uh, disagreement. They're strongly at odds with one another, and it's specifically over the position and role of John Mark. It turns out in, during the first missionary journey, and that you read this in chapter 13, verse 13, John Mark abandoned Paul and Barnabas, leaving them during the first journey. And uh, we don't, we're not sure why, but it's potentially because he had fear of persecution in which they were already experiencing during that first journey. And I can imagine uh, what their conversation perhaps sounded like between Paul and Barnabas, in which Barnabas says, Paul, let's take John Mark on this journey. And Paul says, no, no, John Mark, he's in the way of our mission. No, he can't go. And Barnabas saying, but, but I see a lot of potential, a lot of potential. We need to give him a second chance. Isn't God a God of second chances? And Paul then saying, Barnabas, you're blind. You're blinded because, Bar uh, because John Mark is your nephew. Listen, you've just got to understand he's endangering the mission. It's a no-go. He can't come. Barnabas, not being satisfied, reminds Paul, do you remember when you first came to Christ? Do you remember how all of the disciples would, were afraid of you and would not come to you? There was one person, Paul, who came and began to disciple you. Do you remember who that was? It was me. I saw the potential in you, Paul, and I came alongside and I accompanied you. I was certain of you, Paul, then. And like I have that certainty then, I have certainty that John Mark now. And Paul says, Barnabas, I am the apostle to the Gentiles. You need to yield to me. He does not fit the mission. Barnabas, not being satisfied, says, everything in my heart says that John Mark has some crucial role for the kingdom and the spreading of the gospel. I'm sure of it. No. Yes. <laughs> and that is the fracturing of Paul and Barnabas. I. Howard Marshall says in his commentary that this was a classic example of the perpetual problem of whether to place the interests of the individual or the work as a whole first. And it's interesting that the book of Acts reports this incident, which I think is an evidence of its historicity, but it doesn't take a side. Maybe Barnabas was right, since Paul eventually later on changed his tune in the letter to Philemon. Paul calls Mark his fellow worker. And then in 2 Timothy, he tells Timothy to get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in, in the ministry. But then again, maybe Paul was right, because it was the very rejection of John Mark to go on the second missionary journey that stirred Mark to examine himself and to grow. Perhaps without Paul's correction at that time, maybe Mark would have never have become the man he was destined to be for Christ. But then maybe again Barnabas was indeed right. Mark became a talented fellow worker of both Peter and Paul. And we are in fact all amazing beneficiaries of John Mark as we believe he was the writer of the Gospel of Mark. 
this was a strong difference of opinion, not about doctrine, not about morality, but it was a prudential judgment of foreseeing what to do going into the future. Maybe they were both right, and yet maybe they were both wrong because they chose this separation rather than some kind of principled compromise with one another. Now, I think as we reflect on that story, as this is how the second missionary journey begins with this contention between these two good men, is that the good news is that the Holy Spirit, he draws out the good. It, ultimately, this created two missionary teams, and these were not two factions, but they ended up having a coordinated effort in which Paul and Silas went north to the northern cities of the first missionary journey, and Barnabas and John Mark went south into Cyprus, into the southern cities of that first mis missionary journey. And so they were ultimately working uh, together. But nevertheless, it's still bad news. Uh, there's no way that you can read this story and not feel some sense of, of sadness, of sorrow. And there's, there's a bitter taste in our mouths as we, as we consider it, because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is all about unity, not separation over over opinions. And it, of course, does take two to tango. And I wonder whether Paul and Silas, uh, Paul and Barnabas were, were both not really hearing the Holy Spirit. It's an all too familiar story within, among Christians in, in the missionary mission field, as well as within the church, in which we, we dig in, we're certain about ourselves or our positions, and we're un, unwilling to compromise. And as I was reading this story this week, I was reminded of a brother uh, of a, in the intentional Christian community that, uh, that I live in, in which he lived for many years. Uh, he was a surgeon, and I know a lot of surgeons, and they do tend to be very certain of themselves. <laughs> Pastors tend to be certain of themselves too, so it, it can be a problem. And we had a disagreement over really prudential judgments on how to lead the community. And at times we became like two rams butting heads, and it felt at times like we had headaches. And most, most questions around mission, around roles, they can be resolved with principal compromises. But what gets in the way? Well, I think stubbornness, inflexibility, lack of imagination, it's pride, pride in the end. And when I saw that brother last summer at a wedding uh, that we were both at, I had done a lot of introspection over that relationship and what went wrong. And I went to that brother and I apologized. I said, I should have listened to you, brother. I should have listened. I should have listened more. And in fact, some of the very things that you were telling me that we should do and I refused, we're now making those changes within our community for the better. And he apologized in his own way to me too. <laughs> but something was really lost for the kingdom because we couldn't find a way. And I think both of us were misaligned with the Holy Spirit. Despite our human weakness and maybe even our stupidity, the Holy Spirit still blesses the mission. It amazes me that despite ourselves, he yields fruit. In verse 5 of chapter 16, it says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith and they increased in numbers daily. Good things were still happening. When we see an increase in numbers, glory be to God, but it's not a sure sign that you are right and the other person was wrong or that you're doing things in a faithful way. In fact, it's a sign when there's an increase of fruit and in numbers, it's a sign of the amazing work of the Holy Spirit who works sometimes through us and sometimes despite of us. Which is, I think, why the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 wonderfully reminds us all that we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So this, this second missionary journey begins with a bit of irony, I think. 
It begins with this sense of division, and I think that division signals to us that there's some degree of misalignment that's going on with the Holy Spirit. But I actually think there's a second sign of misalignment uh, with the Spirit, and it's, this, it's the closed doors that we see in this text. In verses 6 and 7, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. Paul and Silas, they're hitting closed doors, and these doors are being closed shut by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who in the Old Testament uh, was given only to some, which is why we read in Numbers 11, Moses longed for the Spirit to be poured out upon all of God's people, and it's fulfilled in Acts chapter 2 when Jesus pours out his Spirit on all disciples who follow him in faith which, so that we all have his Spirit. In the New Testament, the receiving of the Holy Spirit includes his special, wonderful presence. He's described as teacher, as counselor, and as God. And he has these role, roles, uh, both for us individuals, as disciples of, of Christ, as well as for the churches. And this relationship with the Holy Spirit is dynamic and reciprocal. Uh, the Holy Spirit, by faith, we are given his, uh, him as a gift to each one of us, and he indwells us, and he seals us. And yet, we're commanded in Ephesians 5 to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're warned throughout the New Testament that we can resist the Spirit, we can grieve the Spirit, we can quench his fire. We're to be like Peter in Acts chapter 10, who responsively answered to the Spirit's guidance without hesitation. And so we've been given this freedom with God to tune the Spirit in and to tune the Spirit out. The Holy Spirit, He guides us. He guides us primarily through Scripture and its study and in its meditation and prayer. He guides us through Scripture and never in contradiction to it. And like Acts, in Acts 16, He often guides through open and closed doors, which we experience through providence, as well as sometimes through uh, other forms of illumination. In this first instance, Paul went through Phrygia and Galatia, but they were forbidden by the Spirit to share the gospel. And then they tried to go south in Asia Minor, uh, and the Holy Spirit blocked them, and it, we're not told how he blocked them. And I think it's important to realize that a closed door is not sin by any means, but it's a signal that we're not yet on the same page with the Holy Spirit. And so what are we to do when we encounter a closed door? Well, I think first uh, we have to trust that the Spirit of Jesus is sovereign. I love the verse Isaiah 22, 22, the Messianic Spirit in Christ, where it says, He shall open and none shall shut, and He shall shut and none shall open. The glory of the Spirit is when He opens a door, there's no one that can shut it. And when He closes a door, and it doesn't matter how hard you pull, you will not be able to open it. A closed door, it, it can mean several things. It could mean it's just not this door. You need to keep on going. He shut the door. Or it could mean it is this door, but not yet, not at the, in this timing. And it might be not yet because the ones that you're going to aren't ready to receive or because you're not ready to deliver, or maybe it means both. But either way, what we're called to do is trust. Trust the Spirit in His timing of open and of closed doors. He knows what He's doing. He knows more than any of us, and we need to, we need to rest in that. But not only that, when we encounter a closed door, I think it should prompt a spiritual and a moral inventory. I've known a man who I've done some counseling with, and he's been especially, he, he was especially looking for a vocational guidance from God as far as uh, direction for the future. But he was not even trying to obey God in his sexual life. And I tried to tell him, you can't expect personal direction around vocation when you're not willing to obey the very explicit words that God has given in Scripture. 
around your life. You can't, if you're not going to obey what he's already said, he's not going to give you more. You need to first pay attention to first principles of how to live. We're to be and give our lives as living sacrifices. We're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and then we will know his perfect will. So we do an inventory. But not only this, but a closed door, door should store, stir within you prayer and fasting and seeking the Lord, waiting for an answer. But for you, O Lord, do I wait. It is, it is you, O Lord, my God, who will answer, Psalm 38, 15. Amy Carmichael once wrote, you must wait upon him in that intensest form of waiting, which waits on until the answer comes. And it's in the waiting, amazing things can happen in you uh, as he begins to prepare you. Our will weakens. And we, within us, begin to experience a yieldedness to the Lord. And we begin to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And within this spiritual process of waiting and yielding, the Holy Spirit begins to transform and change things so that no longer are you asking him to bless your mission, but now you are being formed in order to do his mission on his journey. Well, it's in, the, it's in the yielding. It's in the yielding that the Spirit particularly offers guidance. In verse 9 of chapter 16, it says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there in this vision, urging him and saying to him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And what I detect within this text is a subtle movement from, from division and separation to closed doors in which... Paul and Silas, they go north, and, and which would be now modern-day Turkey. They're told to be silent and not preach the gospel. They then try to go south, and the Holy Spirit blocks them. And so they do the only thing that they know to do if they're going with all this energy. They keep, continue going west until they arrive to the coastal city of Troas. And I get the sense that Paul finally ran out of places to go. Blocked north, can't go south, and now he's against the agency and he can't any longer go west, and I wonder whether he's finally come to a place of stopping. Proverbs 16, 9 says, In his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And it's there at Troas that the Lord finally reveals his will for this second missionary journey. It comes in the form of this night vision in which the Macedonian man, Paul sees, is calling to him and even commanding him. To, and he says, come and help. And then in verse 10 it says, and when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we, we, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. What stands out to me in that passage or that verse is the word concluding. It's actually a Greek word that means judging together, and it's in the plural. So Paul alone receives the vision, but it's the group, the entire group, evaluating and discerning it in which they realize, yes, indeed, this is the Holy Spirit and, and not Paul's dinner. The group consists of Paul and of Silas and of Timothy and of Luke, he's the one writing, and where he says, we. At times, I'm sure we would all wish to have those four men over for dinner to help us discern the will of God. But the truth is, we don't need those four, because the same spirit that was in them is the same spirit that is in us. And he has not given us those four, he has given us one another in order to discern the will of God to go and for his mission. Discernment of, uh, of this mission, it's intended by the Lord to be received and discerned together. We're not to do it alone, uh, but in community. And it is wonderful when the community of believers has a sense of God's mission and everyone agrees and says, yes, 
That is what the Lord wants. That's what we're doing. It's an incredible opportunity, and it's an incredible moment when all agree, and that is exactly what has happened. But it's also easy to fabricate unity in a, in a false way. Amy Carmichael comments on this in her own life because she moved to Japan to Sri Lanka and it turns out she didn't even tell any of her supporters back in England uh, what she was doing. She believed that her call now to move to Sri Lanka was clear and that eventually her supporters would hear about it and they would support it as well, believing it was the will of God. But then uh, later upon arriving there, she received a wire a cable from her dear old mentor, her spiritual mentor, who in this wire expressed serious concerns about what she had done. And how could she have possibly have done this without agreement of those who had sent her? And Amy had to come to the place where she admitted that she had acted hastily. And dealing still with illness, she went back to England and she realized, realized she needed to stop. She needed to pray and she needed to wait on the Lord. So this second missionary journey, it, it starts off with a sputter. But then with the yieldedness that comes, the Holy Spirit speaks, and he speaks a total surprise. It's a blockbuster of a, of a, of a message, and it's not at all within the Apostle Paul's mind. He did not have imagined going to Macedonia, and it's a major shift. It's a shift from Asia to Europe. Because the Spirit was not satisfied with them just going back and returning to the churches that they had gone. He wanted expansion. He wanted to push forward. And finally, he and the others were ready to receive it and to obey. With that speaking, we move from division to this amazing unity, this unity of mission. And from closed doors of being blocked, of going on in all these different directions, all of a sudden, we, we're not spending any time on it today, but there they are in Macedonia, in Philippi, and there is an open heart. It's Lydia who becomes a, an important person in the establishment of the churches in Philippi and Thyatira. Well, what about you? What about you? Are you experiencing conflict Maybe in your marriage, as you consider a mission that God has for you? Is there conflict around that decision? Are doors being slammed in your face? Then I think the right response as individuals is to gather others, other trusted Christians, to pray with you, to fast, and to wait on him together with a yielded, expectant heart that he is going to show you the way. What about you, church? What about you, church? Are, are there signs of alignment or misalignment? Are we yielded or is there willfulness? Has the Holy Spirit clearly spoken and has been received in unity or are we doing things in our human strength? The critical questions that if Paul could stumble on these things, surely we can as well. And so we must ask ourselves, reflect and be open to what the Lord truly wants to do, the great things I'm certain that God wants to do in each of our lives. Amy Carmichael, she went back to England and she waited for 10 months and she was praying and she was waiting and her body was healing and then the Holy Spirit guided through the coming of a letter. And for 55 unbroken years, never to return back to England, she went to India. And there in this incredible ministry, thousands of girls who were in bondage and in temple prostitution, they found freedom. They found their ama, their mother, and many of them also found their savior, Jesus. Amy, she built an orphanage and hospital and houses of prayer, and she did much more. She faced many trials and she wrote over 35 books, which millions of people have been staggered and encouraged to follow the Lord. And in those books, she wrote many poems. Poems that are full of prayers of yieldedness to the Spirit of God. It's that yieldedness that gives the strength to go on His mission. 
And with this, I'll close her prayer. May it be ours. Give us the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let us not sink to be a clod. Make us thy fuel, O flame of God. And even so, Lord, do it in our lives today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.